The show opens up as God explains that the Earth was created in the year 4004 BC on October 21st at 9.13 in the morning. She then says that we are about to witness the end of days, which is correctly predicted in a book named Nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter written by a witch named Agnes Nutter. The scene then swoops down to the Garden of Eden, where a snake emerges from the earth and tempts Eve to taste the apple. She walks towards the Tree of Knowledge, takes a bite of the forbidden fruit, and even shares it with Adam. Later, as Adam and Eve are cast out of paradise, we see an angel, Azaraphale, watching them from atop the wall that surrounds the Garden of Eden. The snake slithers up beside him and transforms into a demon named Crawley. The duo discuss God's decision to kick Adam and Eve out of the garden. Crawley speculates that by putting a big tree full of delicious apples in the middle of a garden, God wanted Adam and Eve to learn the difference between right and wrong. Otherwise, God would have put the tree on the moon or some other impossible to reach place. On the other hand, Azaraphale says that God's plans are beyond their understanding. Suddenly, the demon points out that his counterpart used to have a flaming sword, which is now mysteriously missing. Just as they watch Adam use a flaming sword to fight off a lion, Azaraphale confesses giving it to help the humans survive in the wilderness. The angel asks nervously if he made the right choice. Laughing, Crowley suggests that it would be funny if he, the demon, did the right thing and Azaraphael, the angel, did the wrong thing. Just then, the world's first rainstorm begins, and Azaraphael lifts his wing to shelter Crowley. This is the beginning of the world's oldest friendship. Flash forward thousands of years, it is now eleven years before the end of the world. In a graveyard, two dukes of hell, Haster and Ligger, rise up from the ground. They complain about Crowley being laid and that they don't trust him because he's been on Earth for far too long. The two fear that he might have become too close to human beings. Soon after, Crowley arrives in his Rolls Royce, dressed like a rock star. The three demons then recount the steps they have taken to acquire souls for their master, Satan. While Haster talks about planting the seeds of doubt in a priest, Ligger mentions that he persuaded a politician that accepting a small bribe was okay. Crowley, on the other hand, recounts taking down an entire cell phone network for several hours. Next, Haster and Ligger hand Crowley a basket with a crying baby inside and ask him to deliver it to the convent of the Chattering Order of St. Beryl. That baby is the son of Satan, the Antichrist. Dismayed, Crowley realizes that the appearance of the Antichrist means that the end of the world is near. Although he, as a demon, is supposed to hate the creation of God, Crowley secretly likes Earth and its customs. Nonetheless, he takes the baby because the order came directly from the devil himself. Elsewhere, at the convent, a group of nuns devoted to serving Satan conduct a meeting. They go over the plan to receive the Antichrist from Crowley and swap him with the baby being born to the wife of an American diplomat, Thaddeus Dowling. All are assigned their tasks except for Sister Mary Loquacious. When she asks about her duty, the Reverend Mother commands her to go get some biscuits with the pink icing on top. However, things begin to go awry when another couple, the Youngs, arrive because Mrs. Young has gone into labor earlier than expected. They hurriedly put her in room number three and usher Mr. Young outside to a waiting area. Within a few minutes, Crowley pulls up to the hospital, unaware that there are now two couples giving birth at the convent instead of one. Mistaking Mr. Young for diplomat Dowling, the demon asks him what room his wife is in. Mr. Young, who thinks Crowley is the doctor, points to room number three. By this point, both women have given birth to healthy, blonde-haired boys. Eager to be rid of his responsibility, Crowley hands Sister Mary the basket and tells her to take it to room 3. Following this, Sister Mary puts the Antichrist into a baby carrier and takes it to room number 3 where Mrs. Young's son is also kept. When Mr. Young comes in, the nun mistakes him for the American diplomat and points at the Antichrist as his baby. Soon after, the Reverend Mother's second-in-command comes in looking for the Antichrist as they have been waiting outside Harriet Dowling's room to make the swap. Not wanting to speak openly in front of outsiders, they attempt to communicate via winking. However, the result is that Sister Mary gives the Young's baby to the Deputy Reverend Mother instead of the Antichrist. This means that, unlike their original plan, the Youngs take home the Antichrist as their son. After the baby swap has been done, the sisters push the couples to name their babies. The Reverend Mother convinces Harriet Dowling to name her baby Warlock, and Sister Mary convinces Mr. Young to name their baby, the Antichrist, as Adam. The following day, Crowley and Azaraphale meet to discuss the end of the world and what to do about it. They get very drunk and bemoan the fate of all things dear to them when the apocalypse starts. However, neither of them can sabotage their sides to stop Armageddon from happening. But they realize that they can attempt to influence the Antichrist as it grows up, thereby neutralizing it. They hope that if the Antichrist is raised with equal amounts of good and evil, they will cancel each other out, and he will end up a normal human boy. Flash forward five years, and Crowley appears at the Dowling's household as a nanny while Azaraphale, as a humble gardener. The angel attempts to teach the boy respect for all living creatures while the demon sings him to sleep with bloodthirsty lullabies. Later, Azaraphale updates Archangels Gabriel, Michael, and other angels on his progress. They congratulate him but 
also tell him that they will understand when he inevitably fails. To Azarafel's surprise, heaven wants Armageddon to happen just as much as hell does. Six years later, the beginning of the end of the world finally arrives as it is Warlock's 11th birthday. Hell sends Crowley a message via his car radio that they are sending the Antichrist a hellhound as a gift. When the child names the beast, he will come fully into his powers, and this will trigger the official start of the apocalypse. Alarmed, Crowley and Azarafel decide they have to stop the hound from reaching the child. They plan to meet the hound first and send it away at Warlock's birthday party. For this, Crowley is disguised as a caterer, and Azarafel insists on being the party's entertainment as a magician. His performance goes terribly, and the kids start a food fight instead. After the chaos, they realize that the hellhound never arrived. Crowley checks in with Hell's Duke. Hatzer, who insists that the hound was released on schedule and should be with the boy by now. This means one thing, they've been with the wrong child this entire time. Meanwhile, in the town of Tadfield, Adam Young, the real Antichrist, and his friends are playing in a wooden fort in the woods. By all accounts, he seems a well-adjusted and normal child. They are talking about his birthday and what he hopes to get as a gift. Coincidentally, Adam really wants a dog and remains confident that he will get one. At this moment, as Adam's friends ask him what sort of dog he wants, the hellhound approaches. The massive, red-eyed beast with a mouth full of sharp teeth stops and listens to what his master wants. In a surprising twist, Adam declares that he doesn't want a big scary dog. Instead, he wants a small, playful, intelligent dog that can learn tricks and go down rabbit holes. The other kids ask him what he will name it, and he confidently tells them that he will simply call his pet dog. At this, the hellhound transforms into a small British Terrier, and the countdown to Armageddon officially begins. In a flashback scene from 360 years earlier, a witchfinder, Major Pulsifer, oversees a pyre being built in the center of town. He is on his way to Agnes Nutter's house, who is accused of being a witch. Unbeknownst to Pulsifer and the villagers following him, Agnes is actually a witch. She has written a book full of prophecies, the only one in history to consist of completely accurate predictions. In fact, she has even predicted her own death and prepared for it by sending her prophecies to her daughter and husband who then become the curators of the book. As Pulsifer and the villagers tie Agnes to a pyre, she beckons the townspeople to come near and watch the burning of England's last true witch. She had prepared for this moment by lining the skirts of her dress with gunpowder and roofing nails. Just as the fire is lit underneath her, a big blast kills all the onlookers. However, her book survives and stays in the family for generations until it reaches her great-great-great-granddaughter Anathema. The young girl grew up memorizing the prophecies, many of which were about her, as they state that she is to be the one who is there for the end of the world. Elsewhere, Major Pulsifer's great-great-great-grandson, Newton, is experimenting with his computer. As he plugs in his machine, the power for the entire city block goes out. This unlucky streak continues far into his adulthood, as he is fired from job after job for his inability to work with any sort of electronics. Frustrated, he wanders the streets aimlessly and lands in front of Witchfinder Sergeant Shadwell, who is currently giving a sermon on the threat of witches. The sergeant sees potential within Newton and invites him to come by his home later. With very little direction in life, the young man decides to take up the offer. In the meantime, Anathema, all grown up, is now taking the necessary steps laid out in her grandmother's book to try and prevent the apocalypse. The first of which is to move to a small village in England called Tadfield. Meanwhile, Azarafel calls Crowley with an idea about finding the Antichrist. He suggests they attempt to visit the hospital as they know his date of birth and birthplace. When Crowley and Azarafel arrive in Tadfield, the convent, which used to be a nun-run hospital, doesn't look much different than it did 11 years ago. But the nuns have long since gone, and now the place is a corporate retreat where co-workers can shoot one another with paintballs in the name of team building. They make their way inside to see if they can find any records. When the angel suggests that Crowley is a nice being deep down, the demon slams him against a wall in anger. They share a tense yet intimate moment that is broken up by Mary Hodges, the owner of the retreat, and also formerly known as Sister Mary Loquacious. They put her in a trance where she answers their questions truthfully. However, she has no new information to offer whatsoever. All of the records that documented the birth details of the kids were also lost in a fire. Having reached a dead end, they wake Mary up from her trance and leave. As they drive home, Azarafel gets a strong sense of love from the area that they're traveling in, something Crowley cannot feel. Across the forest, Anathema is performing the last spell of the night. When she discovers something at a distance, she takes off on her bike vigorously. Between the angel and demon arguing and the witch's enthusiasm, they collide with one another on the road, sending Anathema flying. Azarafel is quick to heal her hand, head and bike, and he offers her a ride back to her home, much to the chagrin of Crowley. In her haste, as she leaves the car, she forgets her book, The Nice and Accurate Prophecies of Agnes Nutter. She doesn't even realize it until much later that night when it's too late. Back in the car, Azarafel suggests hiring a human to find the child. 
but Crowley reminds him that the Antichrist has a defense mechanism built in where suspicion slides off him like water slides off of a duck. As Crowley drops off Azraphale, they agree to use their networks of human operatives to attempt to find the Antichrist. The angel exits the car only to notice the book and keeps it to himself until he can get into the bookshop. Crowley then drives off without any knowledge of what his friend is about to do. Inside the bookstore, the angel puts on gloves and reads on through the night. In the morning, Crowley calls to see if he's found anything. But Azaraphale keeps this information to himself. Meanwhile, his readings have led him to one prophecy saying that the Antichrist is in Tadfield, and his number is 666. Azaraphale calls the number with the area code, and Arthur Young answers the phone. At the same time, his son, Adam, yells that he got his dog to stand on his hind legs, matching a prophecy in the book that says the beast will walk on his hind legs. Shocked, the angel realizes that he has the right number and hangs up immediately. In a flashback scene to the early days of the creation of Earth, God asks Azaraphale what happened to his flaming sword. Azaraphale stutters a lie that he misplaced it. The scene then shifts to Mesopotamia in 3004 BC, as a local man named Noah builds an ark. Azaraphale explains that God plans to wipe out all of the bad humans, and assures the demon that Noah and his family will be fine. Crawley is shocked that God is going to kill kids, pointing out that demons typically do that. Just as one of the unicorns escapes the ark, the rain starts. In 33 Adam Golgotha, Crawley says he has changed his name to Crowley while he and Azaraphale watch Jesus get nailed to the cross. The angel asks him if he ever got to meet Jesus. In response, Crowley says yes and reveals that he was the one who showed Christ all the kingdoms of the world. Next, in 537 Ad, in the Kingdom of Wessex, Azaraphale is riding in war for Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. He confronts the Black Knight, who turns out to be Crowley. While the angel is out to spread peace, the demon has been sent to disrupt it. They realize they kind of just cancel each other out. The following scene shifts to 1601, where the duo are watching a very sparsely attended production of Hamlet. Shakespeare approaches them and asks for a small favor to be a vocal and encouraging audience for his actor playing Hamlet. Later, they realize that they are both headed towards Edinburgh, and Crowley mentions that it's a waste of effort if they both go as the good fortune of the angel will cancel out the bad luck of the demon. So, they flip a coin, which the angel loses and is forced to go to Scotland. In exchange, Azaraphale makes Crowley perform a miracle, turn Hamlet into a hit. When we see the duo once again, it is in Paris, and the year is 1793. Azaraphale is locked in a fortress as the French Revolution rages outside. Having popped across the English Channel for some crepes, the angel was arrested for looking like an aristocrat. Crowley comes in to save him and asks why he doesn't just perform a miracle to save himself. In response, the angel reveals that he was reprimanded by heaven last month for performing too many frivolous miracles. Amused, Crowley mentions that he got praise from hell for the French Revolution, even though it was the humans who thought it up themselves. He then snaps his fingers, and Azaraphale's shackles fall off, and his clothing swaps with that of the guard. Flash forward to 1941, London, where air raid sirens are going off as Azaraphale enters a church to supposedly hand over books of prophecy to the Nazis. They ask him for the nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter, to which he replies that all known copies of the book were destroyed. Just as they get ready to kill him, a woman enters with her gun drawn. The angel triumphantly claims that he was recruited by the woman to foil the Nazis, and they have been played by her clever plan. Unfortunately, the woman reveals that she is actually a Nazi as well, and he is the one that has been double-crossed. Fortunately, Crowley comes in, wincing in pain, and says that a German bomber will drop a bomb on the church thanks to demonic intervention, and if they run fast, they won't die. They hear a bomber flying overhead, and a bomb drops on the church, destroying it and killing the Nazis. Miraculously, both Azaraphale and Crowley are unharmed, and the latter even saves Azaraphale's books. 26 years later, in 1967, Crowley puts together a group of thieves and criminals to pull off a heist for him in Soho, London. Among them is a young Shadwell, the locksmith of the group. He wants them to break into a church to steal some holy water, though the humans aren't aware of that yet. However, Shadwell wants to know if there is witchcraft involved and gets disappointed when the demon says no. Later, outside the bar, Shadwell stops Crowley to tell him about the Witchfinder army, and to offer its services to him, should he need it. Crowley then gets into his car and finds Azaraphale sitting inside. After much consideration and trepidation, the angel has changed his mind about helping his counterpart. He then hands Crowley a thermos full of holy water, and warns that holy water won't just kill his body, but will kill him completely. Eventually, the scene shifts to the present day, just one day before the end of the world. Azraphel hangs up on Mr. Young and tries to plan how he is going to explain the Antichrist mix-up to Gabriel and the other angels. Meanwhile, in Tadfield, Adam is walking with his pet dog when he comes upon Anathema, crying and breaking pots in her garden. She is upset about misplacing the book of prophecies written by her ancestor. Worried, the kid asks if she's okay and offers to look for it or give her the book he wrote instead. She invites him inside for some lemonade. 
but his dog is hesitant to enter because of the horseshoe nailed above the door frame to ward off evil. However, Adam makes it enter, and a little bit more of hell is burned out of the hellhound. Back in London, Newton is looking at the artifacts of the Witchfinder army when he comes across Shadwell's pay ledger. According to the pay ledger, Shadwell does not actually run the Witchfinder army, but has faked a list of generals, colonels, and majors in order to extort more money out of benefactors like Crowley. In fact, at this very moment, Crowley and Shadwell are meeting in a small cafe. The demon tasks Shadwell with going to Tadfield and tracking down an 11-year-old boy. In the meantime, in Tadfield, Anathema is explaining ley lines and auras to Adam, who is eating it up. He gets particularly excited about the witch being able to read people's auras. Curious, the kid asks if she can see his, and she realizes that she can't. However, she doesn't think much of it and tells the kid about saving the environment, the dangers of nuclear power plants, and how we need to get rid of them. On the other hand, Adam soaks it up like a sponge, and when Anathema sends him home with a stack of new Aquarian magazines, he takes them eagerly. Meanwhile, in heaven, Azraphel meets with Archangel Gabriel, Michael, Uriel, and Sandalpin to tell them that Hell has possibly misplaced the Antichrist. He tries to tell them that the actual Antichrist is not with the US ambassador but somewhere else and offers to find out where. It is clear that Azaraphale really does not want a second war, but the angels are committed. After they brush off his concerns and send him away, the angels convene to talk about their mistrust of Azaraphale. They decide he has been lurking around Earth far too long. Back in London, Shadwell is tasked by Azaraphale to send men to Tadfield to investigate Adam Young. He then tasks Newton with going to investigate the village. Meanwhile, in Tadfield, Adam tries to talk to his parents about all of the new things he's learned. His father dismisses it as rubbish, so the kid goes to his room to continue his reading. In the meantime, Crowley and Azaraphale meet as they both look incredibly tense. Crowley asks if Azaraphale has found the boy yet. Still not on board with having to possibly kill a child, the angel pretends like he doesn't know where Adam is. He insists that Crowley, being the demon, should be the one to do it. In response, Crowley tells him that it's a big universe, and even if the Earth is destroyed, they could be friends as they have been for over 6,000 years. He then tells his counterpart to forget that they are on opposing sides. However, Azraphael is stubborn and defiant and tells him that, even if he did know where the Antichrist was, offended, Crowley leaves, telling him, have a nice doomsday. In the final scene, Adam is still reading Anathema's magazines via flashlight late into the night, when a bag of lemon drops next to him. When he goes to sleep, the voices start whispering in his head. As he dreams, alarms at the nuclear plant begin to go off because the nuclear reactor has gone missing. Power is still being generated, but the reactor itself has disappeared. In its place is a single lemon drop. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments if you'd like us to continue part 2. Thank you.